uh, we're on our journey to Easter, and I um, was looking looking at the journey, and I wanted to look at something about how we come to Easter. And so this morning we're going to be looking at how we come to Easter humbly and what that means to come to Easter humbly. And before we hop right into our journey to Easter, I wanted to tell you a quick story about humility uh, by, and I'm going to say this name wrong, uh, Sir Chimonoy. Again, going to say it wrong. Um, but you'll probably know this story once I tell it to you. So there was once a great scholar, and everybody in the kingdom appreciated him because he was so learned. And unfortunately, in spite of his great learning, he had great pride. One day, this scholar put on a gold necklace, and he went to the palace of another king, and he said, whoever can defeat me in wisdom will get this necklace, and I will challenge everybody. All the scholars in this particular kingdom had heard that this skull of this scholar and they were afraid that they would lose. And so they would not accept this challenge. And the king was very sad that no one would accept this scholar's challenge. Finally, the court jester stood up and said, I will accept your challenge. The king almost had almost surrendered to the scholar, but thought it would be amusing to see what his court jester could come up with to try to trick up this great learned man. He believed he was only a joker and he would not be able to win this necklace. The court jester said, I will give you four questions. If you answer any of the questions correctly, I win. But if you answer all of them incorrect, then I will accept defeat. So the scholar had to answer all four questions incorrectly to win. And the king will give you anything you want. So just be wrong. The scholar said, the court jester asked his first question, where do you come from? The scholar said, I live here. This was incorrect since he had come from another kingdom. So by giving the wrong answer, the scholar had passed the first test. The second question was, how long have you been here? Three years, the scholar said, which was also incorrect. Still, the court jester was unable to trick him. The third time, the jester asked, our king is good and kind and generous. Do you agree? The scholar said, your king? What you're saying is totally wrong. Your king is undivine and very unkind. So again, the scholar passed that test. The court jester said, it seems that I can't defeat you. How many questions have I asked you so far? The scholar said, you've asked me three questions. You have one more. If I do not answer it correctly, you will lose. The court jester cried out, look, the scholar has lost. He has answered this question correctly. So the scholar gave the necklace to the court jester, and the jester immediately gave it to the king. And the scholar's pride was totally smashed. He said, I will never come to your kingdom to give a challenge to anybody ever again. All the scholars were very impressed by the court jester's cleverness. They knew that they would never have been able to defeat this great scholar. The jester said, you see, when a great scholar are not alert, they lose. Had he been alert, he would not and have saved himself. As we continue on this journey in Easter this morning, we are going to look at Jesus' stop along the way and this road to Jericho. So we're going to stop along this road from Jerusalem and he is in Jericho. He performed many miracles. He had preached to crowds. He told many parables. And we're going to look at one of these parables today as we come into this season of Easter. Jesus was being asked about coming to the kingdom of God by the Pharisees. And he told them that it was not coming the way they thought it was coming. The kingdom of God was not going to come the way they thought it was going to come. And he then told his disciples that the day was coming soon when the Son of Man would no longer be among them. 
He was foretelling of his death and resurrection and then his ascension. He was talking about Easter. But this morning, we're not going to focus on Jesus' ascension, but rather on how we should approach Easter, how Jesus approached what was coming. And Jesus addressed this in one of the parables that he tells during his time in Jericho. He tells a parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. So in Luke, we're going to be in Luke chapter 18. If you want to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 18, we're going to be mainly in this section. Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 9, it says, He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. Over the next few minutes, we're going to look at the attitudes of these two men, that Pharisee and the tax collector. One was self-righteous and the other was filled with humility. One was seen as a man of God and the other a, crim a criminal who stole more money than what the government required. So we're going to start with the attitude of the Pharisee. Remember, the Pharisees were one of the two main Jewish sects. So there were the, uh, of the Jewish leadership. There were the Pharisees and there were the Sadducees. And the Pharisees hated Jesus and what he was teaching and would try to trip him up on what he was saying and how he was teaching the Torah. They would try to get him to say things that went against the Torah so that they could say, he's false. He's not what he's saying. But Jesus did not mince his words about the Pharisees and their attitudes towards others. He had a lot to say to them and a lot to say about them. So the parable continues in chapter 11. It says, the Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, not extortioners, unjust, adulterous, or even like that tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. The attitude of that Pharisee had when going before God in prayer was to compare himself to others. He wanted to compare himself, say how much better he was than everybody else to lift himself up over other people. Thank you that I'm not like other men. Thank you that I'm not unjust. Thank you I'm not the tax collector. Rather than looking at what he had done or what sins he had committed. He also believed that he would be saved by his works rather than by the grace of God. He believed that because he fasted, more than others, because he gave more tithes than others, that how he treated people and the sins that he committed didn't matter. Instead of praying for forgiveness, he bragged about all the things that he did. There's another time that the, Jesus called out the Pharisees, and it's in Matthew chapter 23, and it says, then Jesus said to the crowd and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Do, so do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders. They, but they themselves are not willing to, to move a finger, their finger, they do all their deeds to be seen by others. They lay up heavy burdens on other people, but when it comes to themselves, they believe their stature will bring grace. And when they do deeds, they do them to be seen, not to just do what is right. They can talk the talk, but they cannot walk the walk. Even though the Pharisees were learned leaders who knew the Torah by heart, Jesus even admitted that. He told them, listen to them. They know what they're talking about, but they don't know what they're talking about. They may be able to recite the scripture, 
but it seems like they don't know the scripture. If they did, they would see that it's filled with mercy and grace, and that's something that's missing in their way of life. But there's someone else in this parable that does see mercy and grace, and that brings us to this next person. It brings us to our tax collector. Tax collectors, even now, probably right now, not the most liked people. But at least now, they have some rules and regulations they have to follow. Back then, not so much. While tax collectors during Jesus' times were considered traitors, they were working for the Roman government that had taken over the land that the Israelites owned, that, that was theirs, that was their promised land. They were ruling over them. And here these Jewish men were going off and taking money from their brothers to give to their overrulers. Not really liked. Plus, not only were they taking the money that the Romans were requiring them to take, but they saw it as a way, hey, they won't know if I ask for an extra 10, or extra 100, extra donkey. So they began to get wealthy, and the people knew it. They were taking more money from the people than what was required so they could be rich. They were thieves, traitors, and sinners. How would he approach God, thinking he was better than everyone else because of his status with the Roman Empire, his wealth? Well, the parable continues in 13, 1813. It says, But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his head up, lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other. The tax collector understood that he messed up. He admitted it. He understood that he was a sinner who needed forgiveness. He felt guilty for the things that he had done, and he mourned those decisions. Where the Pharisee lifted his head high for all to see, the tax collector couldn't even lift his eyes up towards heaven. He cried out, I'm a sinner. Earlier in Luke, when Jesus called Levi, one of his disciples, a tax collector, one of his inner circle, one of the twelve, the Pharisees grumbled and complained about it. They did that a lot. They complained that a rabbi would sit next to a tax collector. But Jesus replied this in Luke 5.31. He said, Jesus answered, those who are well have no need for a physician. But those who are sick, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus brings, again brings up this fact that Easter is not for the righteous, but for those who sin. He came for those in need of grace and mercy. That's who Jesus came for. There's no need for a sacrifice of Good Friday if we were all righteous and sinless. We need Jesus because we are broken people that need the master physician to heal us. The tax collector and the Pharisee have two very different attitudes. Going into the temple, the tax collector was asking for mercy, not status. He was asking for God. He wasn't asking God to stop the people from calling him a traitor or giving him better standing with the Roman government. He was begging for mercy because he knew mercy was over works, grace over works. He was asking for forgiveness from the wrong things he had done. He went before God with an attitude of humility rather than arrogance that the Pharisee approached him with. See, humility isn't breaking yourself down to put others over you. It is not breaking others down to put yourself over them. So what should our attitude be as we approach Easter? On this journey that we lead up into Easter, there was a reason that Jesus told this parable. As, we lead in, as he leads into Jerusalem, 
He knew what was coming. He knew the death that was required for our sins. And he would rise again on Easter morning so that we could have an eternal life with God. Jesus' parables always had a meaning. They were always told at the right time to the right people, though they very much apply to us today. So when it comes to this parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, Jesus was trying to get the point across that we are not saved by works, but we are saved by his grace, by the grace of God. And that when we approach God, we come humbly with our hearts open to what he has for us. So when it comes to this question of what our attitude should be at Easter and at all times, Jesus answers it at the end of the parable. In 14b, it says, For anyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. The first will be last, and the last shall be first. We learn from the Pharisees that when we place ourselves over others in a place of importance, or we think we're better than others, we blind ourselves to our own sins and mistakes. When we begin to put ourselves first over God and what he has for us and what he has set out for us, we become our own stumbling block in faith. If we're exalting ourselves, we will be humbled, either by other people or by our own actions. But when we humble and allow God to be, and allow ourselves to be vulnerable, because that's what the tax collector was being when he went before God and went before the temple and cried out for mercy. When we give space for God to exalt us, he will. And what he exalts, no one can take down. What he exalts, no one can take down. It's the promise of Easter. Jesus came into the city on a humble donkey, not on a war horse. He washed the feet of his disciples. That's not a king's job. That is a servant's job. He was beaten and mocked. He was hung on a cross, the most brutal way of torture in the Roman Empire. He came humbly, but he defeated death. He reigns in heaven with the God the Father. The humble will be exalted, and the exalted will be humbled. That's why we're taking the next 21 days of fasting up to Easter. While the Pharisees pointed out that he fasted, he fasted twice a week, but he lost the heart behind it. When we fast something over the next few weeks leading into Easter, it's about taking time out to come humbly before God, praying and talking to him. We fast something as a reminder to pray. In our busy lives of today, prayer can become an afterthought. We have set a time during the day to maybe talk to God, but then the rest of the day we forget about that part of a relationship that we get to have with God. But when we fast, we're taking something important to us out of our lives and we create space for God to speak to us and for us to speak to him. So when we reach for our coffee and remember that we're fasting it, we can take a moment to pray, whether it be food, social media, and activity throughout your day, that you can take a pause over the next 21 days as a reminder to come before God with an open heart. That's what it's about. It's not about making yourself better than others. It's about making yourself available for God. When we humble ourselves, we make way for God's grace to move and to exalt. In this time that we remember and celebrate, we need to come before God humbly. It's coming to God recognizing that we've messed up and we need Jesus' sacrifice for forgiveness. We need mercy. We need grace. We don't need status in this world. We need forgiveness for our sins for eternity. As we enter the Easter season, we come before God humbly. Jesus made it very clear who in the parable was right. He even said that after the tax collector cried out for mercy, he was the one who was justified. Unlike the Pharisee who asked the same, who left the same as he came in. 
Easter is a time of new growth. It's a new season. Flowers are blooming. Weather is changing. Our hours are taken away. New growth includes more than just flower and fauna. It's about our hearts. When we act as the tax collector in the parable, admitting that we're not perfect and we need Jesus, we open ourselves up to God's grace and forgiveness. We allow God to exalt us rather than exalting ourselves. If the scholar in the story at the beginning had been less focused on his pride and more focused on the challenge at hand, he might have picked up on that gesture's trick question. Over the next 21 days of fasting, I encourage you to use this time of learning and growing in your relationship with God. Humility does not mean that we're putting ourselves down or dwelling on the past. We are a creation of God. And when we ask for forgiveness, we need to let go of the guilt and resentment that we hold. Come before God humbly means that we're trusting in God. We respect ourselves. We are obedient to what God has for us. Jesus continued. He left Jericho. He continued talking in Jericho with the crowds, telling more parables, healing the blind, but he would leave Jericho sometime later to leave for Jerusalem. But we'll continue that journey later on. But I want to encourage you all during this time of prayer and fasting that it's not about being better than other Christians or non-Christians. It's about getting our hearts right with, before God, just as that tax collector did. If it's a certain food or a meal or something other than food you're fasting, remember it's not about the fasting, but our hearts behind the fasting. That's what Jesus was trying to get across to this group of people. It's the heart behind the prayer, not the act of the facade that we put up. So let's start this 21 days before God in prayer. Will you join me? Lord, we enter into the season of Easter and spend time focusing on you. Help us to come humbly before you, not con concentrating on our status or what people think about us, but on how you see us, Lord. Lord, we come before you humbly as the tax collector did not with contentment or self-righteousness, but knowing without you, we cannot have grace or forgiveness. Lord, help us to resist the attitude of the Pharisee and help us to keep the humble attitude of that tax collector. We recognize that it is your mercy and not the things that we can do that we have been saved by. Help us to keep you on the front of our minds as we take these next few weeks to spend time with you through fasting and prayer. Thank you for this journey that you went on to the cross. Jesus being an example to us of humility. We give you all the praise. We give you all, Lord, the exaltion. Lord, we exalt you today, God, for you are truly the one to be exalted above all things. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you. Amen. Amen, church. So as we go out today, in a moment, pastor's going to pray a blessing. I want to encourage you that as you go about your week to remember these two attitudes and who you want to be in this story. So I'm going to invite Pastor Russ up to give us a benediction. Thank you, Pastor Natasha.